place. Here we go once more. Another week of 208 together. Uh, one thing that I want to mention first so I don't forget, uh, since it has uh, come up in previous terms, uh, now that we're in the final two labs where you're doing uh, C coding, uh, a note on academic integrity, GitHub, or any other uh, code repository site is never going to be an allowed source uh, because that will invariably be a complete project of some kind. And if it's a complete project that's relevant to the assignment you're working on, that violates the academic integrity. So as uh, please take advantage of the internet for searching out questions about C syntax or how you do a particular thing in C or some compiler error you're getting, uh, but just steer clear of GitHub, GitLab, um, any of these sites that host kind of entire code repositories as opposed to like short specific examples. Uh, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Great. Any uh, questions on the lab in general? Rebecca? Um, so for the like documentation when we're like describing what each like function does, mm -hmm. you ask if there are any like preconditions or post conditions. What would be like examples of those? Uh, yeah, so you may <clears throat> or may not have seen preconditions or, or postconditions of that terminology in, uh, in other classes. What I mean is basically you're, you're documenting the assumptions of the function. So, uh, for example, the place function takes in a size, searches for a block, may do some splitting. What the place function does not do is worry about the alignment of that side because one of its preconditions is that the size is 16 by 11. And thus, there's code in MM malloc to do that alignment and then, uh, and post conditions are kind of assumptions the caller can make about the behavior. So post conditions could include things about the heap that will always be true in that function returns uh, or things about the return value, uh, other sort of Invariants, they're sometimes called. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other lab questions? Angela. No, I'd be too big to ask, but can you briefly remind me the difference between implicit and explicit preloads? So, as far as the heap itself goes, they're very simple. Because you still have a bunch of blocks, they each have a header and footer, the header and footer size, and, and whether it's allocated or free. And an implicit free list are linked list of blocks. There are no next or previous pointers. We're simply using the size and the headers and footers to get from block to block, which means we have to go through literally every block on the heap. There's no way to kind of skip over allocated blocks when we're looking for a free block. This makes the throughput very, uh, very poor. So the explicit free list is we still have this heap, but now free blocks in the space for the payload are keeping uh, actual linked list pointers, a next and a previous pointer. Uh, and so when you look for a free block, you're now traversing this linked list of just the free blocks. Uh, and this means when you free a block, you need to add it back into this free list. When you coalesce, there's kind of, you have to remove things from the free list. So fortunately, uh, as far as the linked list code goes, it's the same as, as lab zero as I've mentioned, uh, all the same edge cases of when the list might be. Uh, you're adding a node to an empty list, or you're removing the last node from a list. Uh, you'll have to think about all those things. Um, and when doing the explicit free list, you can and should create new helper functions to do uh, the explicit free list, sort of add a node, remove a node, that sort of thing. You may also want to create new functions or those pound defined define macros to extract the next and previous pointers. Since we ha already have ones for header and footer and size and so forth, but not for these explicit free list uh, data structures. Other questions? All right, so I'd like to pick up uh, right where I left off last time, talking about virtual memory. And 
Uh, one important fact about virtual memory that will uh, that already came up in a question uh, on the Lab Four forum uh, is. For the purposes of managing virtual and physical memory from the operating system's perspective, uh, it's going to be divided up into these chunks called pages, uh, which are typically 4,096 bytes or 4 kilobytes, but in some situations can uh, be extremely large chunks, a gigabyte or larger. Uh, and the logic here is the same uh, for caching, why we would want to work with chunks of data rather than kind of a lot of very small pieces is that when we're accessing memory or moving data around, that's an expensive operation. And if we can move a big chunk of it that includes a bunch of stuff that we'll need again or need in the future, uh, that's going to, to be more efficient. So we're going to divide memory up into these fixed size chunks called pages, like for the entire system, the page size is just fixed, so it's just, page size is four kilobytes. Um, and that mapping that I was talking about last time, that was some way that we were translating a virtual address into a physical address, The actual data structure for that is called a page table. Uh, and you can think of it as a kind of big lookup table that's also just in memory somewhere. And we're going to use uh, the virtual page number for some address, and I'll say how we get this in a moment. Uh, but we'll use this as an index into this table. So it's almost like an array, and we're using this virtual page number as an index. And then either we find in the table the physical page number that's going to give us the, the physical address, or we find that the address that we're looking for does not correspond to a valid page. There are different reasons a page might be invalid. Anyone have a suggestion for what one of those might be. We go to access some virtual address, and there's uh, we find that it's it's not valid. There's there's not a page that's currently in physical memory for that address. Charlie. It hasn't been initialized. So we've never used this page before. So. It's, uh, this is a page that we're allowed to access. It's kind of part of uh, the memory that this program is allowed to use, but one of the nice things about this virtual memory is we can tell a program you are allowed to use these addresses, but then not actually allocate physical memory for all of those addresses until the moment that the program actually uses that memory. So we may have lots of programs that are pretty short, don't use much memory, and so we can kind of get away with not allocating a lot of the kind of standard amount of memory that we give to programs, unless they actually use them. So that's one reason. What's another reason why 
we might not find a, a valid physical address. Fine. Exactly. It could be an address that's just outside any of the valid segments for this program, uh, kind of an address in, in no man's land, if you will, and um, in that case we would not find a, a valid physical address for that, and this would likely be a segmentation fault. Stop the program. It's trying to do something that's not allowed. And the last point here is that the page we're looking for could actually be on disk. As if you remember last time I mentioned that virtual memory is going to let us use memory as a cache for the disk, which means that, for example, a program could be using more memory than the total memory available on the machine. But as long as it's not using 100% of that at the same time, we can kind of temporarily shove pages of memory it's not using onto the disk and basically swap them in and out as we go. And part of this sort of lookup in the page table is going to tell us, like, is it a page that's on disk, or is it one that we should allocate right now, or is it just not a valid access at all. Questions on this? All right, let's look at how we actually get this virtual page number. And I think one of the kind of neat things about this is this uh, is an, an important application of the kind of bit manipulation uh, that we talked about early on in the course. Uh, because what this is going to be is where we have our page table in memory, and there's a number of things in the page table, but for our purposes, there's going to be two fields, a valid bit, a one or zero, indicating is this page table entry valid, and the physical page number uh, corresponding to that virtual page. And so we'll have the virtual address that the CPU uses, and we're actually going to break that address into two pieces. a page offset, and our virtual page number. The purpose of the page offset is it tells us where in this chunk of memory, in this page, is the specific byte that we are accessing. It, where within those, say, four kilobytes, is this actual address. And so this page offset, if this whole virtual address is m bits, our page offset will say is p, and then our virtual page number will be m minus p bits. So if our page offset, the purpose is to specify a particular byte within the page, and our page is 4 kilobytes, how many bits is our page offset going to be? It should be able to specify one, a particular one of 4,096 uh, 4, different bytes in our page. How many bits would we need? Why eight? Uh, there, there are eight bits in a byte. Um, 
But that, but here we're talking about four kilobytes, and we want to identify kind of one of one of them. Nick, twelve. Why twelve? Uh, two to the twelve is four times six. Exactly. That if we want to have a set of bits that can have 4,096 different values, that is, give an index to one of 4,096 different bytes, we will need 12 bits to be able to do that. And so the page size is going to determine how big the page offset is, because the page offset is just a spot within the page. Does that make sense? So we take our virtual page number, and we, as I mentioned, just use it as an index into our page table. So it just like goes, uh, indexes us to one of these rows, um, and we look, is this page valid? And this gets us to kind of the different cases where it might not be valid. Uh, if it is valid, we'll take our uh, we'll take the physical page number we find at that entry and combine it with the page offset from the original address. And that will give us, and by combine, I just mean concatenate them. So our physical page number will be the higher order bits of the physical address. Uh, combine them. And that gives us the address we use to actually go and read or write bytes in the physical address. Does how how would you know it's valid or not? Like, um, if it's not on tables, then it's not valid. Uh, so in this model, we have an entry for every single virtual page, and then this valid bit is one if it is valid or zero if it's not. Um, this the valid bit being zero alone isn't enough information to kind of tell us which of these cases, so there's some kind of more detail going on here that uh, if you're curious about our recommend and operating systems course, virtual memory is a huge topic, but we'll kind of keep it in this somewhat simplified view uh, kind of file. And then with the the virtual address, is it the is that the offset? Is that the entire thing? Uh, so let's imagine that our page size was not four kilobytes, but four bytes, just four different bytes. And we wanted to specify one of those four different bytes. Uh, if we wanted byte zero, we could do it like that. Byte one, byte two, and byte three. So I could specify uh, one of these four bytes using two bits, and that's two to the two is four. So if we want to have specify four different possibilities, we can use two bits to do that. And so here our page size is four kilobytes, 4096, and that's going to take 12 bits to give us an, um, uh, specify one of those 4096 bytes, and so that's why our page offset would be the first 12 bits of the address. That, was that your question? Yes. Other questions? All right, let's look at a visual example. All right, so 
what I am showing here is the page table, which is located in main memory, main memory in DRAM, and it has this uh, same structure as, as a valid bit and then a physical page number, and then I'm showing both the, here we have very small physical memory, it just has room for these four pages, and then uh, our virtual memory has room for six pages, uh, but only four of them can be actually be in memory at any given time, and the other two will only exist on the disk. And so if I am accessing virtual address hex 00740B, I'm again saying my page size is four kilobytes. And so my virtual page number will be, uh, uh, let's say uh, that this address is 24 bits. So uh, what will my virtual page number be if this is the virtual address? Four zero B. Uh, yeah, so that's that's the right track. Four zero B will actually be our offset, because those are our lower uh, twelve bits, and the other part of the address, the higher twelve bits, will be our page number. Uh, so we're on on page double O seven, and uh, one nice. Uh, uh, one observation about this that we can make is that this virtual page number, kind of followed by any three digits, all 4,096 of those possible addresses all fall within the same page. And that's really what's going on with this virtual page number. It's sort of an identifier for all the addresses within a, uh, a particular range are part of that virtual page. So our virtual page number is seven, and so we just use that as an index into our table here, zero, PT, by the way, stands for page table entry. Um, so index seven, I see that it's valid, uh, and its uh, physical page number is two. What, that's what happens to uh, be stored um, uh, in the page table. And we can see that virtual page 7 uh, is kind of at uh, physical page 2 kind of in physical memory over there. And so we then take the virtual page, uh, uh, take the, the offset from the original address and concatenate it with the physical page number. to get our physical address. And so this hex 240B uh, would be somewhere inside this page of physical memory. Uh, and that would be the address that the system would actually go and, and rewrite. Do the, do the parts of this make sense? What questions do you have? Kevin. So, uh, yeah, so I'm about to go through an example of, of just that. Any other questions? All right, so this uh, is what would be called a page hit, uh, similar to a cache hit. We went to the page table, we found the page we were looking for. Uh, so let's look at a page fault. Uh, but first, I have a little exercise for you. Uh, I want you to come up with a virtual address that will try to, that will look up the page table entry highlighted in yellow here, uh, and thus cause what is called a page fault.
You can take a moment on your own or with your neighbors, think about what virtual address, what is a virtual address, or what are possible virtual addresses that would uh, give us a page fault at the highlighted page table entry. All right, who has a suggestion for a uh, virtual address that will give us the, the page fault? Uh, uh, sorry, 0x007 and then? 0x003. I see. Uh, and why this address? Because um, it's the sir, it's, it's the uh, address with index 3 that's being um, invalid right now, like with 0. Exactly, that if we take an address that starts 003 with anything after that, it's going to have a virtual page number of 003, and that will index to this page table entry, which we can, which is the one we were we were trying to get to. Uh, it's also not valid, so this will be a page fault. Is that the, any questions on kind of why that's the address that would would take us there? So what happens at this point uh, is. Uh, and we can see that the um, that if we look uh, at the virtual pages that are currently in memory, none of them is virtual page three, which is the one we're looking for. So that it's appropriate that the page table would say it's not valid, it's not in memory. Uh, but one common thing that's often done is that for pages that are that exist but just only are only on disk right now, their location on disk will be stored in the page table. Uh, for those non-resident pages. Uh, so we'll see, oh, here's where we can go find it on disk. Uh, and then our replacement policy, maybe least recently used, maybe something more complicated, we'll need to select one of our virtual pages to uh, kick out of memory to make room for virtual page three. Uh, so maybe that's virtual page two. Uh, so this will get, uh, first this will get written out to the disk. So any changes that were made to this page in memory will be saved onto the disk. Uh, and then page three will be brought into memory, replacing page two. And at this point, uh, we will, can update the page table entry to say, uh, all right, page two has been made invalid and is on the disk, and page three, we update its, oops, not that one. Update this one to say, this page has now been placed at physical page number one, and is now valid, and uh, yeah, but the, in this process, do we physically write or change anything in the disk? Uh, if changes had been made to virtual page two while it was in memory, those are uh, uh, typically they would not have been saved to disk until we evict that page from memory. Uh, if and so in this page table, there's I'm not, I'm not showing it here, but there's often a dirty bit, a bit that we set to one if as a page has been changed at all. So that we know, do we actually need to copy this page to the disk to save any changes, or can we just replace it because it hasn't been changed at all, so there's nothing to save. Does that make sense? Perfect. Other questions, Kevin? So, so I'm a little bit confused about, like, basically, so, so the distinction between virtual memory and physical memory, right? So virtual memory gets like mapped to physical memory through the page table. That's right. But then, um, like, why did we? Why do we change virtual page three? Like, like, so in physical memory, um, where it says virtual page three right now, it used to say virtual page two. Right. 
two. That's right. So why did three, why did two get replaced with three? Uh, so we needed to, so the system is trying to access virtual page three. And so to make that possible, we need to put virtual page three in memory somewhere. Our physical memory is full, and virtual page three is not currently there, so the only way to get it into physical memory is to replace one of the pages that is currently there. Like, there just wasn't room to bring virtual page three into physical memory without replacing something. And so by some replacement policy, like least recently used, the system decides which page to replace. And I just picked virtual page two for the sake of this example. But then it could have easily been like page seven or yes, and it's kind of whatever the the policy and and because uh, replacing the correct the like, the correct page is so crucial to the system's performance. These page replacement algorithms are often quite complicated. Uh, trying to uh, 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 predict kind of which page is is going to be okay to to remove from memory. Other questions? So at this point, the page fault has completed. And now what will happen is the system will restart whatever instruction caused this page fault. Because the page fault, the instruction tried to access this address. It wasn't in memory. So the system took over, resolved the issue because it, in this case it was resolvable, put the right page in memory, and then just restarts that instruction, and now it will look up in the page table, find that it's valid, and continue on from there. Yeah. So this was kind of a nice scenario where we had a, a fault, but it was and it ended up being stored in the disk. Uh, so like, what happens uh, if you try and do it on a null? Like, are there guarantees that uh, what is written as null up there doesn't contain anything, uh, and it's like Guarantee that we won't try and do anything with it. So, uh, if we were to access this page with null, uh, we're in uh, one of our first two, one of our two scenarios here. Either this is a page that's okay to access, it just hasn't been allocated yet, or it's not a valid access. So, uh, the operating system is actually uh, separate from the page table, keeping track of the boundaries like where the boundaries of the stack, the boundaries of the heap. And so it will just check, is this address within the boundaries of some valid segment? In that case, <coughs> what this fault means is we grew the segment kind of its boundaries, but we didn't allocate memory basically until we needed it. So now we should do it. Or it's outside the boundaries. This is a segmentation fault. Terminate the, the program. Kevin? And then, um, I, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So the page people, like, you can't just treat that like a hash map, right? Like, whatever, um, like, you get a payload, not, not a payload, like, you, you get the size of the memory that you need to access, and then you patch it to correspond to some kind of index. Um, the interface is, you know, it, it's determined by size. And then you go to that index and you see whether you can map it or not. If that address hasn't been mapped, then to do this. But then if it has been mapped, it's invalid, and then you go to Google to say it's Yes, or it's a kind of not recoverable fault, and we terminate the program with a segmentation fault. Uh, all right, so what I'd like to do now is tell you about a first in US history, this one being the First World War. Uh, so uh, this was a war that spanned the globe, but started in Europe, where the uh, so-called central powers of Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, Turkey, and Bulgaria um, uh, fought a war against uh, England, France, uh, uh, Russia, um, Italy switched sides partway through. 
Um, and this is uh, relevant to, uh, so this, this war began in, in 1914 uh, without the involvement of the U.S. And at this time, uh, the U.S. kind of public sentiment was very opposed to kind of involvement in uh, 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 foreign wars or kind of other things like that. And this was a, an extremely popular song at the time. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Um, and uh, uh, pre the president of the time, Woodrow Wilson, uh, opposed uh, U.S. involvement in the war and won re-election in 1916 on the uh, in part on the campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. Uh, and then there were a few things that changed uh, U.S. attitudes. One was uh, something called the Zimmerman Telegram, uh, which was an inter uh, the British were uh, intercepting messages on the undersea cables under the Atlantic, and they had also broken uh, the German encryption. And so they intercepted this telegram to uh, uh, German agents in Mexico, uh, instructing them to promise Mexico a return of the territory the U.S. had taken in the Mexican-American War if Mexico declared war on the United States in the event that the U.S. declared war in Germany or the other way around. Uh, and then this um, uh, was published in, in Life magazine kind of about this uh, uh, event, kind of showing that the U.S. would be divided up between uh, Germany or, or Prussia and Japan, um, none given to, to Mexico in, in this rendering. Uh, so this, this made people pretty angry. And uh, this coincided with the... Uh, resumption of uh, German submarines or U-boats uh, sinking U.S. ships in the Atlantic, uh, because even though the U.S. wasn't in the war, uh, U.S. businesses were sending lots of weapons and supplies to uh, Germany's enemies. Uh, and so here is uh, Wilson uh, in Congress. Um, he asked Cong uh, uh, he's here. He asked Congress for a declaration of war. Uh, here is. Uh, Headline, um, so the U.S. was was mobilizing for, for war. And one of the interesting things that came out of this period was the U.S. Food Administration, uh, because there was kind of critical food shortages across Europe after years of total war. Uh, and so there was an effort on the part of the U.S. government run by future U.S. President Herbert Hoover to get people to kind of conserve food um, and the the verb hooverize uh, came to, to be used to mean to kind of uh, economize and save. And so uh, you had kind of posters that were saying, eat more corns, oat, and rye, eat less wheat, meat, sugar, and fats. Um, here's every spoonful, every sip means less for a fighter, telling people to stop drink, drinking sugary beverages because uh, sugar was in short supply. Um, stores or, or other places would kind of hang up these signs, member of the Food Administration, here's a poster saying, save wheat, people are starving in France, uh, they need it. Um, uh, and there was uh, this push to have like wheatless uh, Wednesdays or like porkless Thursdays to get people to, to conserve. Uh, and there was also a fair amount of price controls, you couldn't kind of charge, uh, the government just said you can't charge more than this amount for various uh, commodities. Uh, and this sort of uh, kind of rationing could control would uh, return in the Second World War, um, and kind of an interesting expansion of uh, the federal government during this period. All right, let's do a little practice. Do First up, which of these would not cause a page fault? Uh, the majority has this one correct. It is dividing by zero is the one of these that will not uh, cause a page fault. Um, y is kind of what's different about dividing by zero compared to these other these other three. Yeah, it's not a memory access. Page faults are just about looking up an address in the in the page table. Other questions? Questions about this? 
Uh, Could you just explain a little bit more why this two reference thing and not one will cost a H12? Uh, yes, so anyone remember like what numerical value null stands in for? It's zero. And so dereferencing a null pointer says access address the memory at address zero. Address zero is never going to be part of any of the like valid segments. And so it will always hit a page fault when it goes to try and find that in the page table. Yeah. Can you explain the architecture, like accessing part of memory for the first time? Like what, what, what does it mean to access something for the first time? So one cool thing that virtual memory lets us do is we can say this program has We can give it an entire page of its stack kind of at the start of the program. Uh, and we can give it, say, four pages of code of its instructions. Um, but importantly, At this point, we have not actually allocated a page of physical memory. We've just told this program, you have a page of memory in your stack region. And for the code pages, we don't actually have to bring these into memory at this point. We simply set up the page table to refer to the locations of uh, this code on the disk. And so, the nice thing about this is, say this pr program uh, doesn't actually uh, uh, use this page on its stack. Well, we never actually have to allocate it. Say there's a bunch of kind of special case code uh, in part of its code that's never get, never gets used. We never bring those in. Uh, we never bring those into memory from the disk because they're never accessed. Uh, so accessing part of the program data for the first time means we've kind of set up these regions, but we haven't allocated them yet. Anders? Um, so then you would go and allocate it, don't you allow the program to keep memory? Fine. Yeah. So, but in the case of uh, dereferencing the pointer, it's the same point. Uh, that's right, because the this sort of region, uh, the these regions that we've set up, none of them will ever include address zero. So are there any general like rules about how page faults relate to set faults, or is it just kind of case by case? Um, so I guess all segmentation faults are a kind of page fault. Um, uh, and particularly, they're a page fault in which the problem is not recoverable. There's like no way to for the operating system to like fix memory so that this access will work. There's there's no, it's like not part of the valid region that we could allocate a page for. It's not referring to a page that's on disk. And so the only thing we can do is terminate the program. Other questions? All right, little practice with uh, our kind of uh, address space math. So here we have a one megabyte byte addressed machine. What I mean by this is there is one megabyte of physical memory and each memory address refers to a separate byte. And there's four megabytes of virtual memory. And pages are 128 kilobytes. So in this situation, we have enough information to figure out the page offset, uh, the number of bits in the page offset, the number of bits in the virtual page number, and the number of bits in the physical page number. Uh, so take uh, a moment to see if you can think through how many bits each of these will be. Something that may be helpful, kilobyte is 2 to the 10th bits, uh, 2 to the 10th bytes, sorry, 
megabyte, 2 to the 20th. All right, votes for some votes for all of our answers. So please discuss with your neighbors uh, how you're approaching uh, this problem, and I'll be wandering around if you have questions. All right. So some movement toward B. Uh, that's definitely on the, on the right track, but we'll actually have D. And I'll note that the difference between these is that if we add the bits and the page numbers to the offset, we get 22 and 20. So uh, can someone walk us through how uh, you thought about uh, D here? So just to start, I started with the page offset. So if you need uh, 128 kilobytes for your page, you need, you, need, you need 17 bits to make that work. So the seventh times two to the tenth for kilobytes. Going to go two to the seventeenth since we just add the exponents. Yeah. Um, and this may not be like how everyone else has thought about it, but I I said if you have one megabyte of byte address memory and you want to fit you want, to, like, you want to fill it with 120 kilobyte pages, you can only make, you can only have eight pages in there. So you need three bits to correspond to those eight pages. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a nice way to think about it. We certainly we can say, okay, one megabyte is going to have two to the 20th different addresses, um, meaning that our physical addresses will be 20 bits. And if 17 of those are the page offset, that leaves three left over for the physical page number. How about the uh, virtual page number? How do we think about that? Oh, you want me to go sure. Uh, well, I, I said because it's four times larger uh, than how much memory you actually have, you need uh, four times as many, not four times as many, but like you need to keep track of four times as many possible locations. Yeah, and we can, uh, two more bits gives us four times as many addresses, so one to four megabytes. Um, and also uh, look at the total size of a virtual address for four megabytes, that's two to the 20th times four, two to the 22, and if 17 of those bytes are a page offset, five, the rest, the five left over are a virtual page number. All right. Can you explain again how you got the So, uh, or actually, the, I guess the whole virtual address uh, size. So, I can look at the total amount of virtual memory and see that there are four megabytes, or 2 to the 20th times 4, since each megabyte is 2 to the 20th. So, we have 4 times 2 to the 20th. I'll rewrite 4 as 2 squared, and then add our exponents together to get. I have two to the 22 bytes in virtual memory. And so if I have an address that is going to specify one of two to the 22 bytes, it's going to need 22 bits. So the beep and the page offset make up the 22 bits. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's hidden behind the screen. If I raise the screen for a moment to remind us that our virtual address is just the combination of our virtual page number and the page offset, and our physical address is just the combination of the offset and the physical page number. Other questions? All right, so uh, this uh, this idea of a page fault that we've been talking about is one example of a kind of larger category of, uh, of things. And uh, this relates to kind of the way that, that systems are normally arranged, which is as follows. Uh, we have some hardware. 
and we have a piece of software called the operating system kernel, which uh, is directly interacting with that hardware. And importantly, this operating system kernel is trusted, meaning that we're saying this is kind of not uh, uh, just something that anyone can go in and kind of write their own program and run like this is part of the operating system. It's not being uh, uh, messed with. And uh, living on top of the operating system kernel, we have various applications, just uh, web browsers, uh, audio players, games, word processors, kind of whatever applications. And uh, some of these applications may be extremely confused and do strange and bizarre things. <coughs> some of these applications may be mustachioed and villainous and uh, be full of, of evil intentions. And so all of these applications are going to be untrusted. That is, we are not going to allow our applications to interface directly with the hardware, because then the buggy ones or the evil ones might uh, uh, Compromise our system in all sorts of bad ways. But where do drivers fit into this? Uh, drivers are a particular part of the operating system kernel, and a driver is a piece of code that uh, describes how to interact with a particular hardware device. So. The operating system needs to know how to play sounds on your particular sound card. It needs to know how to uh, communicate with the internet using your particular network controller. Uh, and instead of the, each application having to have hundreds of different versions of it for each different kind of possible device uh, it might have to interact with, the operating system kernel just has all these different drivers built in and knows how to talk to all sorts of different devices. So drivers would be part of this trusted code. Other questions? So a page fault is part of a general class of, uh, uh, of events where an application turns over control to the operating system kernel. So in the case of a page fault, the application tried to make a memory access. Uh, it did not find a valid entry in the page table. And this triggered a page fault where the program stops running and a function called a page fault handler in the operating system kernel takes over, handles the page fault, and then restarts that application program instruction. Uh, these events are often collectively called exceptions. Uh, there are different kinds of exceptions, and the textbook and the notes go through these different kinds. Um, but for our purposes, we'll just think about them in general. And we kind of general picture is the user code is running along and then something happens. This could be uh, a page fault, this could be a divide by zero, this or various other kinds of exceptions. Uh, but when the exception happens, control is transferred to the operating system kernel, which will then handle the exception uh, in kind of whatever way is appropriate. And at the end of the exception, we will either 
restart the instruction that caused the exception. This is what happens in the case of a, uh, of a recoverable page fault. We might, uh, depending on the kind of fault, resume execution at kind of the next instruction after the one that caused the exception, uh, or such as in the case of a segmentation fault, we might abort the program and never go back to the user code. Uh, but in the cases where you go back to the user code, it sort of continues on uh, as if nothing had happened. Does that make sense? All right. So, question? Okay. So, uh, one really useful thing that these exceptions allow us to do is to have the system switch which program it is running. Because we know that computer systems can run lots of programs at the same time. We see that every day. But if a program was running and there were and there was no such thing as an exception, then if this program kind of never gave up control of the CPU, it would just kind of maintain, uh, keep running on the CPU forever and never let anything else run. So you can think of a program that was just in an infinite loop, there'd be no way for any other program on the system to be able to execute unless there was some way for control to be taken away from currently running programs. So there's a particular kind of exception called a timer interrupt, which is on the CPU, there is a timer, and at periodic intervals, and these are uh, quite short, kind of on the order of uh, milliseconds or, or microseconds, uh, whatever is currently running is interrupted. There's an exception. And at this point, the kernel can decide, should the current program keep running, or should I switch to be running a different program? And This ties into there we go. Uh, and so this ability to switch which program is running uh, ties into something called the process model, which is I've been using the word program to describe kind of different applications running. Uh, program's not uh, a kind of precise technical term, um, but the term process uh, means kind of what I'm showing here, kind of a, uh, a program that has its, kind of its own private virtual address space. A, a process has its own stack, heap, data, and code. And a process also has the illusion that it is the only thing running on the CPU. Uh, it has the illusion that it's the only thing that is changing the register values of the CPU. But in actuality, only one of our processes can be running on the CPU at a time. And so how uh, does this work? Well, each process in its own virtual memory has a copy of its register values that get saved. And so when one of these timer interrupts occurs and the system is going to switch from running one process to another, it will kind of take the value, the current values of the registers, save those to memory, and then switch to a different process and take those saved registers and load them onto the CPU. And because those registers include the instruction pointer, this also loads kind of wherever this process left off is now loaded onto the CPU. Uh, and this allows the system to 
do what's called time slicing and rapidly switch between a bunch of different processes, which gives us the illusion that they're all running simultaneously. But in fact, each of them is running for, say, a few milliseconds at a time, and we're just rapidly switching between each of them. And so what is actually happening on the system is process A ran for a little bit, process B ran for a little bit and finished, then we ran process C for a little bit, then we went back to process A and so on. But what we see is process A was running this whole time and you know, took, uh, uh, took this much time and process B and process C were also running uh, continuously this whole time. Uh, and this uh, model is kind of fundamental to having computer systems that aren't just locked in to doing kind of exactly one thing uh, at a time. What are your questions on this? All right, that looks like a sign that we are good to go for today. Uh, office hours in the lab tomorrow night. Uh, there is this week's quiz on Moodle, also due tomorrow night. Lab 4 check-in post due on Wednesday. See you then.